as you know, this is the year that we've been preaching on, the year of the Ecclesia. And this is one of our scriptures that we've been talking about. And this morning it would be remiss of me if I didn't start with this scripture. Because it says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. God's special possession that you may declare. Learn to look to your neighbor and say, declare. declare. Say it again. Look to the person on the right and say, declare. declare. That you declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into this wonderful light. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I decrease so you can increase, God. God, I pray that you would just speak because your servant is listening today, God. God, I ask that every heart would be just tender to your word. And God, that they would hear the voice of you and not of me. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. You may be seated. I don't know where my wife went to, but I first want to say uh, thank you to my wife, uh, my beautiful bride, uh, Tammy Faulkner, Pastor Tammy Faulkner. She is absolutely an amazing godsend. And uh, I just want to say, babe, wherever you're at, I love you. I honor you. Um, I choose you today, and I love you every day because I choose you. Amen? Amen. If you don't love your spouse, uh, there's something wrong. We'll talk after church. We got marriage counseling for you. Um, can you say amen? Turn your Bible to the book of Luke, where we're going to be coming out today in chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verse 40. And it said, on the other side of the lake, the crowds, say the crowds, the crowds, say it again, the crowds. See, one thing you're going to know about me by the end of this service is I am very much about participation because the longer I have to keep repeating that, the longer we'll sit here today. Can you say amen? See, amen. There you go. You're getting it. All right. And we said, and, the, and on the other side of the lake, the crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting, say waiting. For him, And the man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at the feet of Jesus, pleading, say pleading, with him to come to his house. For his only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying, and Jesus went with him. And he was surrounded, say surrounded, by the crowds. And a woman in the crowd suffering for 12 years with a condition or a constant bleeding, she and she could not find a cure. I want to say that again. And she could not find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe and immediately the bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. And everyone denied it. And Peter said, Master, the whole crowd is pressing against you. But Jesus said, somebody deliberately. Someone look and say deliberately. deliberately. Say it again, deliberately. deliberately. Someone deliberately touched me. For I felt the healing power go from me and begin to tremble. And the, excuse me, and all the power went out from me. And when the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. And the whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had immediately been healed. Daughter, he said, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Today I want to share a message on a title that's not always welcomed in churches. But where is my miracle? You heard several songs kick off in this service about miracles. And all of them had a theme of where is my miracle. See, all of you got a note card on your chair. Everyone got your note card? Take it out. Every chair has a note card. So I want you to take your note card in your hand if you have it. And if you have a pen, get a pen. You should have a pen because you should be taking notes. If you aren't taking notes, you can find my notes at TC77411. My notes might not make any sense to you, but they make perfect sense to me. 
Can you say amen? If you want to put that up, where is my miracle? I want you to take this card and I want you to take a second and I want you to write down something that you want. Something you've been praying for, something you've been asking God about. You say, well, I'm new here. This is my first Sunday. Welcome. We want to welcome all our first time guests. But I still want you to write something down because there's something that you've probably been asking, asking God for. And no, I want to put this disclaimer. This is not a name it and claim it message. This is not something that I'm telling you. You write it down. God's just going to miraculously do. But I want you to truly write down something that you've been longing for, something that you've been praying for, something you've been desiring. Maybe it's a, 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 an illness to be healed, or maybe it's something that you've been uh, wondering about. It might be finances. It might be an addiction. It might be something that you have that you've been praying about that you needed a miracle, that there's no way that it could happen. See, some of us have walked into this place because I've been here. Some of you walked into this place and you looked around and you're looking for a miracle. You're looking for a miracle for yourself or maybe for a family member. You're looking for a miracle and you've been pleading and you don't understand. You've read it in the Bible for all these years. You've read in the Bible that there's miracle after miracle after miracle, but you've not seen it happen yourself. You might not have seen it come for, to fruition in your life and you started to doubt or you started to hesitate and even say, God, do you even hear what I'm saying? Do you even hear when I'm talking? But I got some news for you today that Jesus is still in the same business that he was 2,000 years ago. He's the same miracles that he did back then, he can do today. If you don't believe me, turn to Hebrews 13 and 8. It says, for Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you believe the Bible? Do you believe what it truly says? Some of you have come in from the outside and you're a little angry, bitter, hurt, confused, mad, frustrated. You say, why are you talking so hard this morning? God laid this on my heart about seven months ago and it's stirred for the last seven months and I can't get it out of my spirit because God told me that this is a house this year of miracles. I walked up to Pastor Allen in January and I told him God is about to shift something in our church and every week Week after week after week, we've heard messages over and over and over again about very similar topics. And it is about rebuilding or things that God is about to do. Pastor just said it this morning. There are things that are about to happen in this church that we don't even know what is about to happen. And we can't even wrap our mind around it sometimes. The Bible says in Luke eight forty that there were crowds of people all around. And we know the story of the woman of the issue of blood. And if you don't know, this woman had, and we're going to talk about her for a couple minutes, but she bled continuously for 12 years. And during this time, she was rejected. She was separated. Everyone knew that if you had this issue, if you were unclean at that time is what the Bible describes it, that you had to isolate yourself. So many times we have Christians that come into this church that have to isolate themselves, they feel like. They listen to the things that are around them and they start to begin to isolate themselves. But she separated from everyone that she loved. She was depressed. She was angry. She, the Bible says she could not find a cure. I want to say that again. She could not find a cure. Are you looking for a cure for your miracle? Are you looking for it? See, she couldn't find the cure because she didn't have the answer. See, the answer wasn't within her. She did not have that within sight of her own capabilities. But see, Jesus said that somebody in that crowd, there are crowds around in that day. And I always think about sometimes about the things that weren't written in the Bible. Anyone ever think about that or is it just me? The things that weren't written, see, the scholars didn't write down absolutely everything. There were gaps in there, right? There's a storyline behind that. And I noticed that when he said he was on the other side of the lake, there was a crowd. Y'all said it. There was a crowd, like a crowd in this. 
See, we build a church for God around the presence of God. And when you walk into this place, if you didn't feel it, I promise you, his presence is here this morning. Can you say amen? And it doesn't matter. You could be in the crowd and still not touch Jesus. See, there was a crowd around Jesus. And the Bible says that they were pressing on him. Anyone ever seen a mosh pit before? Where the crowd is around and people are like just bumping into each other? You ever been to a concert to where you're pushing and you're right on the front? You got the best seats in the house. You are right next to the stage. Concert's going on. Music is bumping. Boom, 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 boom. Right? You got it going on and you're right there at the front. And what do you feel behind you? Pressure. There's people pushing. They're not deliberately touching you, but they're touching you. Right? But the Bible says that Jesus stopped in the middle of this. And he said, but wait. Someone deliberately touched me. Sometimes we come to church and we might touch God, but did you deliberately touch God? You can put that up. Are you deliberately touching God this morning? See, there's crowds all around. And we know that Jesus was pressing in, or they were pressing in on Jesus to get a touch for a miracle in their life. But the Bible talks about two miracles that happened in that passage of Scripture. That it wasn't that the crowds got delivered. Wouldn't it have been a great story if it said that everybody in the crowd got their miracle that day? But not everybody in the crowd got their miracle that day. I got news for you. It didn't happen that way. It tells about two miracles that happened. I don't know if someone else got, uh, got uh, uh, healed or delivered during that crowd. It doesn't say, but it might have happened, but I don't know. But I would like to believe that the people that were in the presence got something from Jesus at that time. But the story was really about two people. It was about the woman with the issue of blood. And when she deliberately touched Jesus, the bleeding stopped. Have you ever cried out and needed something and there was someone that could help you around and they didn't help you? You ever been broke down on the side of the road with a flat tire or out of gas? Maybe it's just me. I used to drive a car that didn't have a gas gauge. Right, Mario? And the gas gauge just didn't work right. And it, somehow I would run out of gas at certain times. And the most irritating thing was seeing someone drive by as I'm standing there in the dark on the side of the road and no one stopped to help. That's how some of the people felt in that crowd and that's how sometimes we feel when we come to church is that we come by and there's people coming by and up to the front and they're getting healed and touched and miracles are happening and I'm just standing on the side going, but why not me? Why didn't you stop and help me? God, why didn't you stop and help me? Where's my miracle? And then the anger builds. The bitterness builds. The sorrow builds. The heartache builds. Jesus said, did you deliberately touch me? At this point, there was a huge crowd. And they were very persistent and pressing into Jesus. And they didn't all get their miracle except Jairus and the woman. See, people ask, why, why are there miracles in church? Why do you talk about miracles in church? See, I truly believe in miracles because I am one. I believe in miracles because I've seen them my entire life. I believe miracles because I know what God is capable of doing even if he doesn't. I'm going to say that again. I know that there are miracles because I believe in what God is capable of doing even if he doesn't now. So many times as Christians, we want God to do things our way. Psalms 34, 17. He said, for the righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all, say all, all their troubles. Do you believe the word of God? See, I believe every word of God, and I've emphasized a few words for a purpose. 
Because, see, as you emphasize certain words, I truly believe that the righteous, the first part of that is the righteous. Are you living righteously? Are you in the right standing with God? And then the next word is cry out. Are they crying out? Are you truly crying out to God or are you just crying? I'm going to say that again. Are you crying out to God or are you just crying? There's a difference. You don't believe me? Ask anyone with a child. If you've got a child, you know the difference between crying out and crying. Crying is when they're just throwing a fit, right? I don't get my way, mom. But when they're crying out, they go, dad, help. Right? There's a difference in a cry and a cry out. The question is, are you crying or are you crying out to God? See, some of us as Christians, we come to God and say, God, why not me? We're crying, but we're not crying out. That's the difference between touching and deliberately touching God. See, Jairus fell at the feet of Jesus, pleading. And the woman said, if I could just touch him. See, they were very deliberate. They were very intentional. See, we don't use a certain word around this church. It's called the busy word because we don't believe in just being busy. We believe in being intentional because when you're intentional around God, things begin to move and shift. I'm going to say that again. When you're intentional around God, things begin to move and shift. I have a lot to cover, so I'm going to move fast. Jarius fell at the feet pleading with Jesus. Some of us haven't got our miracle because we're just watching in the crowd and we refuse to push in and touch him. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be a spectator. Don't be a spectator. Turn to 1 Samuel 17. I'm going to talk about a couple different stories here in the Bible. As soon as the Israel... Israelite army saw him. They began to run away and fight in fright. Have you seen this giant? Men asked. He comes out each day to defy Israel. And the king has offered a huge reward for anyone who kills him. He will give the man one of his daughters for his wife. And the man's entire family will be exempt from paying taxes. Could you say amen to that? David asked the soldiers standing by nearby, what will a man get for killing the Philistine? I want to say that again. David asked the soldier standing nearby. He said, what will a man get for killing the Philistine and ending the the defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And these men gave David the same reply. They said, yes, that is the reward for killing him. But when David's oldest brother, Eli, heard David talking to the men, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway, he demanded. What about those few sheep that you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and your deceit. You just want to see battle. David said, what have I done now, replied David. I was only asking a question. And then he walked over to some other men and asked them the same thing and received the same answer. Then David's question was reported to King Saul, and the king sent for him. Don't worry about the Philistine, David told Saul. I will fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There is no way you can fight the Philistines and possibly win you are only a boy and he has been a man of war since his youth i have a couple steps that i want you to pay attention to these steps are very very important as a christian as a believer as a non-believer these things are very very important number one you can write them down who are you listening to be careful who you're listening to in your faith Your faith will waver depending on what report you believe. Your faith will begin to be shaken depending on what you are listening to, who you are listening to, and what they are telling you into your life. See, this morning, God wants to do some things for some people this morning, 
but you've been listening to the wrong people. See, the woman had the issue of blood, and she didn't listen to the doctor. She didn't listen to the law and isolate herself. She defied the even law because she could have been stoned to death for being in the presence of the people, but she knew she had to do something because she was desperate. When you become desperate, you begin to start doing some things. You start listening to people. See, Jarius, when he was in the middle of the crowd, the Bible says that Jarius was there and he went to Jesus and he fell at his feet and he said, I need you to come with me. My daughter's about to die. How many men out there have a daughter? Let me see your hands. I bet some of y'all would have cried out to Jesus if you knew your daughter was dying. I know I would. Any one of my daughters. If they were about to die and I knew they were dying and he was my only hope. See, Jairus was a synagogue leader. And, the, and all of the religious leaders at that time, they didn't like Jesus. They were talking about him. They were plotting to try to get rid of him. They thought he was a false prophet. But see, Jairus believed something that they didn't believe. And he said, I just know that I need something. And I know a man that can help me. Jairus got desperate and he fell at Jesus' feet. And Jesus said, I'll go with you. I'm going to go heal your daughter. And in the middle of that, the crowd was pressing in. People were trying to slow him down. And the woman with the issue of blood came up and just interrupted everything. And Jesus just stopped. How many of you in your life, Jesus has been, you felt like he was doing something. And all of a sudden, it just stopped. The miracle or the thing that you thought was going your way, everything was starting to work out. And you're like, God, this is getting good. All right, you're going to come to my house. You're going to make my miracle happen over here. And then all of a sudden he stops. It's because Jesus had another assignment at that time. See, it would have been great if Jesus would have got there and the little girl was still sick. And Jesus would have healed her. That would have been a pretty good story. But see, that wasn't the assignment. See, there, there was something else that had to happen. And that woman stopped Jesus in his tracks and said, she deliberately touched me. I got to stop to take care of this. He didn't forget about Jarius. He just said, hold on a second. I got a bigger assignment right now that everyone needs to see. See, there's some of you in here that, that you are the Jarius. And see, at that time, as Jesus was healing the woman with the issue of blood, see, Jairus got a report that his daughter had died. Jairus had a choice. He could have walked away. And a lot of us as Christians or people that have been in the church, we got a report about something that was bad and we walked away. See, I, I, again, those stories that aren't quite in the Bible, but what if? What if Jairus would have walked away and lost that miracle? See, sometimes as Christians, Jesus has you on the path and he says, just hold on a second. I got to take care of this. He said, wait, this is not our time to move. Wait, I need you to stand here. Wait, because I've got something greater. Yes, I can heal her while she's alive. But what about when I can raise her when she's dead? What's the difference of that miracle? Because if you're sick, that would be a great miracle that you got your healing from your cold. But if God raised someone out of a grave, that would be something totally different. See, Jesus said, I got something greater in store, but you got to wait for a second. Sometimes as Christians, we get impatient when God says, just wait for a second because I got something greater for you, but you don't know it's coming. See, David heard his brother Tell him, why are you asking these questions? What have you done now? David replied, I'm only asking questions. See, David could have listened to his older brother, which he probably should have, but he didn't. See, David said, I'm not talking to you today. I'm coming over here. Hey, what happens if I kill this giant? Right? He said, I'm not going to listen to you, older brother. I'm going to go ask the question again. See, he didn't just ask the question once. He already got a reply. He knew the answer. But David said, I got to ask the question again. Some of you all need to ask the question again. God, what do you want me to do now? God, I need to hear this one more time. Because David already knew he was anointed to be king. And he said, I got to get to the palace somehow. 
if it's killing this giant and that's the next road, great, God, let me tell you, tell me how. Oh, wait, I get to marry the king's daughter? Woo, that might be the way in. That might be the pathway. God, let me kill this giant so I can just go and marry the king's daughter and then Saul's going to love me. Right? I'm going to be king for sure. And David didn't listen, but he was driven by what he knew that the story that he heard that if he killed the Philistine and ended this defiance. This is just one more step for David to be king. See, when you listen to others, sometimes you stop pursuing what God has called you to do because they tell you, stop asking questions. Then he went to the, the Saul heard this and he said, send David to me. The king, the king that David had respected, he knew that God had called Saul. And he said, I respect Saul. You don't believe me? Finish reading the story. I don't have time to get into all of it. But with David pursuing King Saul and how he had an opportunity to take Saul out, but he didn't. But that's another story. But he said, I know that God called Saul. So I honor him. And Saul told him, don't be ridiculous. You can't kill this giant. Don't be ridiculous. Some of you have been told by people that you love, people that you admire, don't be ridiculous. And it defeated your spirit. Your faith started to crumble. Your faith started to slip away because you listened to the wrong person. Tell your neighbor, don't listen to the wrong people. And down in verse 38, it says, Then Saul gave David his own armor. a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on and, and strapped the sword over it. And he took a step or two to see what it was like. For he had never worn such a thing. And I can't go into, I can't go in this, he said. He protested to Saul. I am not using them. So David took them off again and he picked up five smooth stones from a stream and he put them into the shepherd's bag. And then he armed with only a shepherd's staff and a sling. He started across the valley to fight the Philistine and Goliath walked out toward David with the shield bearer in front of him. Snaring in, in contempt at this ruddy faced boy. He said, am I a dog that he roared to David that you come to me with this stick? He said, and then he cursed David with the names of his God and come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and to the animal. Goliath yelled at David and David replied to this Philistine, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of the heavens of the armies and God of the armies of the Israel whom you defied. Today, say today. today, today the Lord will conquer you and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give this dead bodies to the men and the, uh, your men to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God of Israel. And everyone assembled there will know that the Lord rescued his people but not with sword and spear, but this is the Lord's battle. Say that this is the Lord's battle and he will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out after him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag, he took a stone and he hurled it with his sling and he hit the Philistine in his forehead. And the stone sank into Goliath and he stumbled and he fell face down onto the ground. And David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone for he had no sword I'm gonna say that again for he had no sword then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from his sheath and David used it to kill him and cut off his head and when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead they turned and they ran What are you putting on? What do you put on every day? What are you putting on? See, David said, okay, Saul, 
Let me get your armor, right? All right, David. Come on. Right? So hold on. Got to zip that up too. Be inappropriate. We're on YouTube. See, David's like, let me, let me take a few steps. Let me try this armor out. Let me see what it's like, right? See, sometimes as Christians, we just put on some things that other people have, their armor, because we respect them. The things that they use to fight with, the things that fit them really good, because I'm sure this fits somebody, but sure don't fit me. Maybe a year ago, it might have fit me pretty good, but it don't know more. See, there's something that when you're trying to fight with something, imagine someone going out like this, right, and running. Y'all seen them, right? They running like this, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. How silly they look because they put on other things that don't belong to them. See, as Christians, you got to stop putting on things that don't belong to you. See, David said, I tried this, but this ain't me. This ain't working for me. I got to get, I got to get David like, right? He said, I got to be like, like me. I'm a, I'm a kid. I don't need this. Bump that. I don't need this. He said, I can't put on what you wear. I can't wear the things that you wear, Saul. See, Saul's armor fit Saul. It was customized. See, he could fight a battle like no other in his armor. And he thought, if I could only give David what I have, whoo, yeah, this will, here, this will work. David's like, this is ridiculous. That's what we look like sometimes as Christians coming in church trying to put on things that don't belong. You're trying to do ministries that aren't call, you're called to. You're trying to do the things that God hasn't wanted you to do. He said, I've called you for a purpose. And your purpose is customized for you. Stop trying to wear the things that don't belong to you. Take them off. You look ridiculous. Can I keep it simple today for you? The first thing was, who are you listening to? Second thing, what are you putting on? Number three, use the armor that God's given you. See, David... He grabbed some rocks, and he got this thing. It was a sling. He said, man, I'm used to this. See, sometimes in our life, those things, they look appealing. But really, all you need is this. And if you read the Bible, Goliath, and it describes his armor to the T. It even gives you the weight. The weight of the sword, the weight of the javelin, the weight of his breastplate. He even had someone in front of him, an armor bearer, that went before him and held a shield to protect him from anything. So imagine, it wasn't just one person out there. It wasn't a nine-foot Goliath. The Bible says he was over nine foot tall. We'd all be freaking out. Like six, six guys scare me, and I'm six foot, right? Imagine nine foot tall. Like, he'd be ducking on the ceilings in here. And little David said, let me get some rocks. How silly. See, sometimes the armor that God gives us doesn't make any sense. Sometimes the things we have to pick up and use to fight the enemy in our lives doesn't make any sense. But he said, all I want you to do is get something that I've called you to use. I want you to use the armor that you have, the armor that you need, the armor that fits you. See, a lot of people, it doesn't say that he killed bears and lions all out there. With It says he grabbed them by the jaw and he beat them with a club. That's what it, the Bible says. I don't ever remember reading about when he used a sling except when he killed Goliath. But I promise you it wasn't the first time he used it. It wasn't, the, he didn't grab something and just say, hey, let me try this out for a minute. Because see, I thought about grabbing a rock in this and just doing this a couple times, but I'm sure someone would have got hit with a rock like Pastor Brittany throwing stuff all over the place. I wasn't about to give someone no concussion. Right, but, but using the armor that David was comfortable with, the Bible says that he took it out and he got it. 
See, in Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, it says, Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, putting on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts and wickedness in heavenly places. Right? So therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day. And having done all to stand. How many of you ever felt like it's, you've done all you can do just to stand? Because the enemy has just fought you over and over and over and over again. But he said, have girding your waist with the truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. But above all, say a but above all. But above all, see, I love God. God knows when to throw a word in there just to give you some excitement. He said, but above all. He said, stop, hold on, wait a minute. But above all. All. Come on, somebody. You all know I was going to say it today. Come on, somebody. Right? But above all, putting on the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one, and taking the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Come on, somebody. And praying in the spirit by watchful, uh, being watchful to this end and all perseverance and supplication and for all the saints. Come on. And for me. That utterance may be given to me. That I may open my mouth boldly. I want to say that again. That I may open my mouth boldly. To make known the mysteries of the gospel. How many knows the gospel is a mystery sometimes? The mystery of the gospels for which I am an ambassador in chains that I might speak boldly as I ought to speak. See, after David sank, the Bible says the, the stone sank in his head. It pierced into the flesh. And sank into his head. He said after it sunk into his head. What if David stopped? See Goliath fell face first. But what if after David did this. He said I just defeated the giant. He's laying down face. Man that thing went into his head. He's out. He's done. He's gone. David could have got back up. And he could have walked over to Saul and said Saul look. He's there. Give me my wife. Let's have a party. Let's go. But the Bible says that David ran over and he pulled the sword from the sheath. Because the Bible says he didn't have a sword. See, he grabbed the enemy's sword. How humiliating is it to be killed by your own weapon? And he grabbed the sword and he just cut the head of the giant. Some of us as Christians, we get so far in life, things are going good, Pastor. It's good. We're year three. We built the foundation. Church is growing. We're packed. I don't even know how many people are here, but it's all good. There's a lot of visitors. There's people that have never even been here before, but that's okay. And see, God has you here for a purpose. You're not here by accident just to see a baby dedication, by the way, just so you know that. God called you here for a purpose today, just so you know. Because your Goliath was laying down there, but instead of getting a sword and cutting off his head, you left the sword with the enemy, his sword, and you walked away and said, okay, it's good. I'm going to stop pressing. I'm going to stop moving. I'm going to stop moving toward what I have to do. I'm just going to stand right here because it's comfortable. I already, I already knocked down the giant. I already showed everyone. You can't tell me that the Israelites were just standing there going, I hope he finishes him. No, they were cheering because they just saw the guy that had defied them for 40 days laying face down with a rock in his head. They were cheering him on. Let's go. Yeah, you got this. Yeah, we won, right? It would have been easy to get caught up in the victory. 
And sometimes we get caught up in the victory and we forget that the Goliath that is, has been attacking us for days on days on days is still alive over there and we didn't go cut off his head. See, God has called you to be a warrior. God has called you to be a David. God has called you to stop. Don't stop halfway in where you're at. You got to finish the fight. You got to finish it off or that giant's going to get back up. That giant's going to come back over and he's going to haunt you. He's going to get you and he's going to try to kill you. So many Christians leave church because they forget. They forget that their Goliath was still alive. Then the Bible says David ran over and picked up the head of Goliath after he killed him. Number four, stop trying to pray away your Goliath. See, the woman with the issue of blood, she tried to find doctors to get rid of this illness. Jarius, I'm sure, tried to see doctors and get all these people to help his daughter and, and to heal her, gave her some home remedy to try to heal his daughter before he finally got desperate and said, I got to find Jesus. Some of us, sometimes we go through the same thing and we're like, God, take this from me because I can't handle this. Anyone say that prayer or is it just me? Maybe I'm the only one. I'll get real today. Anyone ever try to pray away something that you're going through because you didn't want to go through it? Do you ever ask God, God, take this from me because I can't take this. I can't put up with these kids. I can't put up with these grandkids. I can't put up with this job. I can't stand this boss. God, I can't do this. We try to pray away what God wants to use for a miracle in our lives. So many times we want God to take it away and God says, I want you to go through it. He said, I want you to fight that fight. I want you to go through this because I can't be victorious unless I let you go through this. So many times we want things just to be so easy as Christians. We want to come in here and say, everything's going to be good. I got news for you. It's called life. It's going to suck sometimes. Can I say that? I don't know if I can, but I did. It is. It's going to suck. It's going to be bad. It's going to be hard. And you're not going to know what to say or what to do. But in James 1, 2, and 4, he says, Finally, my brother, count it all joy. I want to say that again. Count it all joy. Count it all joy when you, when you fall into various trials. Knowing, it says, knowing that the test of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Do you want to lack nothing? Do you want to lack nothing? Do you really want to lack nothing? That's what the word says. Do you believe the Bible or not? Is God a liar or not? I apologize to all of the families that were out here that had to take pictures with my ladders. But the ladders represent my life. See, when I got saved, this is where I was at. And I started climbing with God. And then there were th some things in my life that I, I could kind of teeter back and forth. And I'd get up here a little bit more and then trials would hit me and some things would happen and I'd fight with my wife and kids were acting up and and I'd, I'd still lean to this and then sometimes I'd act a fool and be stupid and but God I love you and I'd go to church and oh all right yes amen lion let's roar right we'd, we'd sing it right this is a house of miracles oh yes it's good and then I'd go back out and I'd live where I was at and doing the thing, and I'd go back and forth and back and forth. And see, as Christians, sometimes this is how we are in our lives. And you're like, God, I, I, I want to be with you, but God, this is comfortable. See, like, I could stay here all day. I'm not afraid of a ladder when I'm like this. Like, most of y'all would be like, oh, my God, he's going to fall, right? Like, but I'm good with this. 
because there's stability. I feel comfortable. Some of you as Christians, this is what you're like in your life because I was here. I was grabbing on to a little bit of this and hanging on to a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of the world, but it wasn't things that were taking me to hell. It was stuff that just made me comfortable. It was stuff that made me feel like everything's okay. And then I'm like, oh, God. And then I get into my prayer life a little more. And then Jesus said, it, it, it worked on my life. See, see, can you put that picture up? See, October 12th of 2021, there was something that shifted in my life. There was something that changed in my life. You say, what is all this? What kind of church did I walk into? Can I get a little real with you today? Can I get a little real with you today? Because I'm gonna, I didn't know if I was going to talk about this today. You can ask Chloe. It's in my notes. They got a video that they're going to show here in a second. But God shifted something in my life. October 10th, 2021. Show the video. Hey, Pastor Sonny. Hey, just wanted to, hey, Pastor Sonny. Hey, just wanted to shoot you a quick message, man. Um, Really enjoyed your service today. Um, your message was on point. Um, I want you to know that it was on point for me. Um, and I've never thought alcohol was a heaven or hell issue because um, I have never really had a problem with it. I could tell you probably how many times I've been drunk on, my, on one hand. Um, but I did occasionally drink. I would social drink. Um, I would drink when my knee was hurting and say it's medicinal, um, that it helped with the pain. Um, but after today, um, I will just tell you, um, all of this was in cupboard. Some of this still has dust on it that has never even been opened. Um, that's been in there for years. Um, but I will tell you, it's all going away. Um, you needed to know that because the message you preached was right on. You said something that it's not even about me, but about my children and my children's children and my children's children. And God told me a long time ago that I needed to stop this. And I was debating, I guess you would say, back with God. And today you hit it right on the, right on the head. Um, and I didn't put this in the group, Marco Polo, because this is something, though, I wanted to share with you. Um, so just confirmation that your word was exactly for the right house, for the right moment, um, for the right time. Um, and I thank you. I thank you for it. It wasn't a time to share, uh, there. Um, I've already, uh, uh, started dumping. Um, but I wanted to go on here and just, uh, uh, let you know, I love you. I appreciate your honesty. I appreciate your word. I appreciate the fact that you took the time and listened to the Holy Spirit um, it is saving generations. Um, I believe that it's going to save my children and my children's children and my children's children's children. And so I honor you. I thank you, um, for being the pastor that stands up, the Elijah that stands up in our era, that's not afraid to tell us how it really is. Um, so I just wanted to tell you, I love you and I appreciate you and thank you. To God be Today, my last two grandchildren got dedicated, by the way. <laughs> Come on. All five of my grandkids got dedicated. They, they belong to God. I know as parents and grandparents, we think we own them, right? We don't. Um, they're truly God's. But see, what I didn't know is two months later after this time, two months later, you can put that picture up. See, this is my little brother. David. David passed away two and a half months after that video. His wife and daughter sitting in the crowd. His nieces and nephews are all right here. David was 40 years old. Three young kids. He was your neighbor. Lived right across the street from you. We didn't even know that. He just started coming to the church. I was in a spot on this ladder back and forth. 
And see, I had choices. I had choices that I could have stayed living the way I was living. I could have stayed doing the things I was doing. And I wasn't promised. But I do know this. In my brother's death, something shifted in my life. You can ask my wife. I'm not the same man. I don't pray the same. Pastor Sonny taught me that. Him and I had some prayer meetings for the two weeks that David was in the hospital. I got a picture of me, him, and my dad standing in a parking lot holding his prayer cloth, praying over it. And we walked in, gowned up during COVID, in the COVID ward, in the ICU with my brother intubated, covering him with this. I put every miracle and prayer scripture I could find in the Bible. And I'm not talking about five or ten. I'm talking there were hundreds of them. And I taped them on the wall and on the bed and on the counter. Those nurses thought I was the craziest guy in the world. And I prayed and I prayed. Every time I walked in there, I cranked up the worship music. Every time I did, every time I was alone, I prayed. I'd cry out for hours and hours and hours at a time. I didn't know how to pray before my brother got sick. That all shifted during that time. See, as I was on here and I made that decision, I was somewhere about right here. And God said, October 10th, 2021, he said, I got to prepare you for something and I can't tell you what it is. He said, you're going to go through something and you're going to get here, but I need you to trust me. Do you trust me? I said, okay, God, I trust you. He said, but do you really trust me? I said, I trust you, God. He said, okay, keep climbing. I said, but God, he said, do you trust me? I said, I trust you, God. And he said, then keep climbing. I said, but God, this is uncomfortable, God. God, I want to go back to that. I want to get back to that alcohol. And he said, but that's not where I want you. He said, I need you right here. He said, because it's, it's December 1st. And you don't know what's about to happen. I said, okay, God, I trust you. And I began to cry. And I felt uncomfortable and I was pressing. Because see, when I was in the world, I was all in. I did, I was all in. I said, oh yeah, this is the party world. Yeah, oh yeah, ooh, it's dark up here. It's lonely up here. Where'd everyone go? I'm looking for some things, but I don't see nothing. It's dark. There ain't nothing here. See, I thought all the answers were there, but they weren't. It was lonely. It was dark. And when I got here, I'm like, God, I know there's got to be more. There's got to be more up here, God. And he said, there is, but not where you're at. I'm like, but God, I'm right where you told me to be. He said, no, you're not. He said, you got to do something different. I said, well, what do I got to do, God? He said, he said, you got to do something different. You got to do this. See, I need you to get all the way to the edge. I need you to get out of where you used to be. See, that was your comfort zone. And I need you to get over here. See, there's a drop off. And so you got to be careful with the, with the leg. I need you to get right here. Like, I want you to the edge. I want you to the extreme. See, in the world, you were extreme over here. You would go up, you were party, you'd do whatever, right? I was extreme when I was in the world. How many was extreme when you were in the world? See, I was out there. I didn't care. There's a few of you in here that know what I'm talking about. Ruben and I could tell you story after story about vacations and where we got liquored up and where we went on cruises that some of it we didn't even remember. And it was fun. But this time, he said, I need you to move. And I need you to do this. He said, and over here, he said, but if you do this, see, you get up to this spot. 
He said, wait, hold on. He said, there's, there, there, there's, wait, I got more for you. He said, hold on, I got more for you. I said, but God, I, 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 don't, I don't know. He said, but wait, see, wait, hold on. Where, whoa, whoa. See, there's some things up here. He said, there's some things up here. See, there's some gifts and some things that I got for you. See, he said, because sometimes we're looking for some things. And see, the good part is up here. See, I can go all the way up. That's right. I'll fix that later. See, I'll go all the way up, and I'm secure. See, most of y'all are freaked out, but what you don't know is there's a pipe up here. See, there's a steel pipe up here that I can hang on to. See, there's something that's not letting me go up where you can't see. See, some of you, you're scared because you can't see where God wants you to go, but God wants you to go somewhere that's above what you can even see. See, we're limited in what God can do because we limit God to the ceiling. God said, I got a whole nother level that I can take you to if you'll only trust me. Where's your faith? Do you truly trust me? See, as I continued to grow, there were things and miracles that happened. See, the book of Michael 151 SBIB version that should be in the Bible version, right? If you didn't catch that, that's Michael. I'm Michael. It's not in the Bible, so don't be looking it up. <laughs> the SBIB version should be in the Bible. See, you can't get your miracles when you're on the wrong ladder. And you can't get your miracles when you're on the right ladder and it's in the wrong position of where God wants it to be. Can I say that again? See, you can't get your miracle. You could be going to church. You could be in the crowd. You could be in the presence. You could be there, but if you're not deliberately touching him. See, you can't deliberately touch Jesus and you're, you're aligned with where he wants you to be. And I got news for you as a Christian. If you think that your ladder can stay in the same spot all the time and you live however you want to live, you are living a lie and you're still hanging on to your old ladder. I know because I did it for years. See, God didn't call me to preach last week. He didn't call me to preach when I gave up alcohol. He called me to preach a long time ago. And I didn't do it. Did it for a while, but I did it on two ladders. I did it the wrong way, Derek. I wasn't doing it the right way. I was showing my kids the wrong things. I had my son-in-law making me drinks at a bar when he first met my daughter. Now he dedicated his youngest child to the Lord. Being prepped in ministry to be called to do what God has called you, you, you to do. Will you put up that picture of last Sunday? Pastor Brittany preached a message last Sunday. See, I tried to preach like other people before, but that's not me. So you get Michael. This is how I preach. If you don't like it, I apologize. That's why they gave me the spark plug award. Because sometimes I get a little crazy. I do things crazy. But what I will tell you is this. I refuse to go back because that was me. I was planted in the wrong soil. I had rocks. I had things and people could very easily pluck me out and shake me around and put me in a different pot because I wasn't rooted in Jesus. I was rooted in churches. And if you're rooted in a church, I got news for you. Even if it's this church, you're rooted in the wrong thing. Because this church is not about the church. If you haven't figured that out, this is not about the church. This is about God and his calling on your life. He has called every one of you for a purpose. And there are miracles in your life. The problem is, see, I didn't put those up there at the very last minute. Those were put there in advance. See, your miracles, they've already been placed in advance. 
question is, are you going to go get them? You don't believe me? Find it in the Word. It's there every time. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's already done it. Everything in your life has already been mapped out. Everything that you need. The question is, do you want it? Do you truly care and want to move your ladder to get into the position of where God wants you to be? It says, 1 Peter 2 and 9, and I'm going to be wrapping up. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, that you may declare the praises of him. Number five, it's the last point I have. You must declare the praises of him. See, that word declare means formally announcing the beginning of the state of a condition. I want to say that again. It's formally announcing the state of a position or a condition. See, our pastor said something <laughs> during the year of the stretch. I don't know if you remember this. I know Anissa gets it. I don't know where Anissa just went to, but Anissa gets it because I've heard her say it. But our pastor has a saying that you got to say it till you see it. And when you see it, you're going to say it. I want to say that again. He said, you have to say it till you see it. That means you have faith to believe that I can say something without seeing it. See, I knew that there was a miracle up here because I placed it there. But no one else knew to move the ladder to get that miracle. But what if I told you, hey, up there by the light, guess what? I got something for you. You got to say what you want God to do in your life. You got to keep believing it. You got to keep saying it. That my children are going to serve the Lord. My grandchildren are going to serve the Lord. My great, great, great grandchildren are going to serve the Lord. I am going to be a prophet of God. I am going to be a minister of God. I am going to work. I am going to give. I am going to love. I am going to do what God has called me to do. I'm going to stop smoking weed. I'm going to stop drinking alcohol. I'm going to stop smoking cigarettes. I'm going to stop. You say all these things are legal. You're right, they are. And I'm not telling you you're going to hell on it. I'm telling you, you have to decide what ladder you're standing on. Because there comes a time that you're going to go through something that could be life-changing. What I will tell you is this. If I would have still been drinking when my brother died, I don't know if I'd be here today, and I'm just going to tell you that. It's just facts. I believe God does everything for a purpose. My God doesn't have accidents. Do we have life? Yes, we do. I didn't understand when David passed. But I knew it was God that had me. I knew one day I would still be with my brother. And one day I will be with my brother. See, spiritually, we're running over to giants and we're knocking them down. We got to take the sword out spiritually and cut off their heads. James 2 and 17, it says, So you see faith by itself isn't enough unless it proceeds by the good deeds. It is dead and useless. See, these are for someone today. Alex, come here. Come here. Holy Spirit told me to give you this. He told me to give you that because you want to study the Word. You don't want to read the Word. You said you wanted to study the Word. So that's for you. See, presents come in different fashions. You say, why is in a box and why is one wrapped? Why didn't you wrap both? I didn't even tape this one. Did you?
not just hear the message, stop trying to have something that someone else has. Your blessing is different. Your miracle is different than someone else's. Stop trying to emulate it. Stop trying to make it look like what you want it to look like. It doesn't make it any different. Irvin, come here. Irvin, you started praying in a way that you've never prayed before. And this is a journal. And I want you to open it. And in this journal, God taught me this when I learned how to pray. He said, start writing it down. Just write it down. I don't write down every prayer, but I write down some prayers certain prayers and I want you to start journaling your prayers because God is going to turn your prayers into miracles your prayers that you pray they need to be specific because when you pray you don't pray for just yourself see God gave you a heart to pray for others to pray for other people (laughs) yes Holy Spirit And the things that you're about to prophesy into people you don't even know. So don't stop. The enemy's tried to tell you that it's useless and that it doesn't matter. But I want to tell you, your prayers have been heard, that God hears you. Okay? Love you. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Now I'm going to ask you on that post a note that you wrote does your, does your miracle that you want line up with where God truly wants you to be or is it on the old ladder over on the other position and if it's in the ladder or this other ladder I want you to flip your card over and I want you to write down something else when you go home I want you to find out where God wants you to be where God truly wants you to be. As I told you, you're not here by accident. And I know I got shared a whole lot. But there are miracles that are placed in your life that you don't even know are about to happen. But if you stop looking, you'll never find your miracle. If I would have never got on this ladder and went up into that roof, those would have stayed there forever. So this morning, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I don't want anyone looking around. You say, Pastor Michael. Thank you for joining us today. If this message has blessed you, we would like to encourage you to share it with a friend. To learn more about us, find us online and on social media at The Church PHX. See you next time.